Um, so what I wanted to talk about today is, um, so I'm obviously really old, Janice is not, but I am really old. Um, I worked as a journalist for about 15 years um, after graduating from Grady, um, but I've now been an academic for 30 years, for quite a long time. Um, and I've been te and in that time I've been teaching and studying journalists and their response to change. And as you can imagine, over 30 years there's been a lot of change <laughs> to study and a lot of things that they've, uh, the journalists and journalism and the industry has gone through. And that's kind of what I want to talk about today because, and, and most of that change has been intertwined with technology. It's not all about the technology, but the technology is kind of implicated in, in pretty much all of the change. And so, but what I'm interested in, in, I'm terrible at technology per se, but what I'm interested in is how journalists respond to that. And I think the response has been pretty consistent to these successive waves of massive change over the past 30 years. Um, and so that's kind of what I want to talk about. And my, sort of my premise is that innovation, the idea of innovation is very appealing. Innovation has this very um, kind of progressive concept around it. That, that innovation is a, is a good thing. Innovation is going to be something that helps us succeed. It's going to help us go forward. It's going to help us be successful. Um, it, it's, uh, this is from um, a couple of colleagues of ours. You say it's weighted with the promise and expectation that it's going to solve the problems. Innovation is something we're usually very much in favor of or, or say that we are. And if you talk to newsroom people, it's very hard to find someone in the newsroom that is going to say, uh, no, innovation, that, that, that terrible thing. So, so we're kind of all in favor of this, this idea of um, a, sort of a positive, forward-moving change. However, <laughs> I want to suggest that actually changing, so we're in favor of the idea. We all say, yeah, innovation is great. Who wants to change? Eh, who actually wants, who wants change? But who wants to change? <laughs> <laughs> we don't actually want to change. Um, and I, because change is hard. Change is, it means doing things differently. It means giving up something that we're very comfortable doing, that we know how to do, that we're confident about, and doing something that probably doesn't fit any of those categories. It's different. Um, we don't know how to do it. We don't know how it works. Um, and so we're, we're, we, we, we want to innovate, but if it actually means change, but I do, I know how to report, or I know how to take pictures, or I know how to, um, uh, uh, you know, copy edit, uh, sub edit, copy edit. Sorry, it's copy edit here, it's sub edit in the UK. Whatever it is, I know how to do, and you're going to ask me to change how I'm doing that. I'm I'm a little bit more hesitant, well, I'm considerably more more hesitant about that. So what I want to talk about today is I, to me, looking back over way too many years and all these different sorts of things that journalists have had to deal with, it kind of seems to me that the response to that has been pretty consistent, a big picture. Obviously, these are very different things, and I'll go through some of them, just, just a few, a select few, um, uh, the kinds of things that journalists have had to respond to. And the, and the response has been, I think, quite consistent over the years. And, and I, I am going to show you some cherry-picked quotes. I admit that they're cherry-picked. I could find other quotes. Um, but big picture, it's this it's initial resistance, and that resistance tends to be framed in terms of it will be bad for journalism. This new thing, whatever it is, is going to be bad for what we do as journalists and the, and the role that we play, the, the kind of the social role that we play. So, so that's kind of my premise here, and you can um, happy to, to debate that, because you can find other quotes. There obviously are journalists um, and news organizations, big picture, but certainly journalists at an individual level, there's always people who are enthusiastic and eager, actually do want to change. Um, they tend not to necessarily be the majority, <laughs> um, but there's always those people in an organization. But big picture, journalists, I think, like probably like all humans, um, are, are somewhat resistant to change. So that's kind of what I want to talk about. Um, this is a little bit of context. Um, we were just talking about this in the, in the lunch group. Um, and you may have come across this idea um, of winner take most, because I think, and the reason I have this slide here, because I think what happens when that's the response to change, because change eventually happens. The internet was new. It's kind of hard to imagine not living with the internet. Um, but, the, but the reaction to it when it first came out was pretty similar. But, but because there's that initial resistance, it takes a while to get over that to where you've got a critical mass of people who actually are doing this new thing, who actually have changed. Um, and so the changes over time tend to be kind of small. It's kind of step by step. 
and, and somewhat incremental. And I think that favors this concept, which um, you can find it in various places, but um, well articulated in the Reuters Institute does an annual report, and this is um, their, their latest one, and they talk about this. They've talked about it in other editions of this report as well, that what happens when you've got that sort of initial resistance followed by, you know, eventually we kind of <laughs> um, are dragged kicking and screaming into adopting this new change, is that the ones that are more proactive, which tend to be the larger news organizations that can afford to experiment, that have the resources, to some extent have the time because they tend to have more people. They can take that kind of experimental approach. They can try this new thing and the stakes aren't all that high for them. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work and they do something else. But if it does work, then they're that much farther ahead. Um, and so, so I think this contributes to this winner take most um, news ecology which these people and others have documented which is that what we're seeing now is that the, the strong news organizations are getting stronger. It's kind of the rich getting richer. So the New York Times is doing pretty well. Washington Post is doing pretty well. The, the, the Guardian in the UK is doing pretty well. But a, a lot of others aren't. They're, they're kind of getting farther and farther behind. And some of it is because they don't have the resources or the kind of cultural mindset to adapt or adopt change quickly. Um, and so I, I think this is kind of contributing to this, this issue where a lot of organizations are struggling and will continue, have been struggling for a while and probably continue to struggle in part because of this response and in part because of lots of other things, resources, their, their uh, economics certainly, um, the, you know, their position in their communities and lots of other things. But, but I do think this, this response, this kind of, yeah, I don't think I like this response to change is exacerbating the situation, which is just for a variety of reasons, but um, I think that this, um, that what I'm going to talk about kind of makes it um, more evident maybe is the way to think about it. And, and what are the winners winning? I'm going to talk about innovation, but just to set this up, what, what are they winning <laughs> with their winners? Well, the, I mean, these obviously go together, but what they're winning, so because they're able to, they kind of have that both cultural space and, and the resources to try out these new things. Some of those things work, and audiences tend to like them. Audiences are almost always, in general, big pictures audiences are ahead of the newsroom. Um, so they, so they, audiences like these things, and they get audiences, and people share this stuff, and um, uh, they, they, um, they benefit that way. I have lots of cheesy internet graphics, sorry. Put something on these slides. Um, so, so they, the, the 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 ability to innovate and the ability to be creative um, tends to be tend to be things that people come and look at, right? So, it's whether that's oh, it's all kinds of different things. You know, the the it's simple as the way the website displays. New York Times recently has a kind of a new, relatively new sort of rolling display. Well, it's very engaging. Um, so, they, they tend to be able to do that. Right? Other, other organizations can take them a while to get there. Um, and, they, and they use some of their resources that they've got to hire people with expertise in those areas. And so they just, the rich get richer, right? They, they just keep doing more. And of course, that means they have more money. They have more money to start with. And because they can do these things, they get more audiences. They can, um, they can, they can kind of um, expand and do some different kinds of business models and try them out. Um, and so, so what do the winners win? This is what they win. And the, and the organizations that are struggling are losing both of these things. They're losing audiences and they're losing money. So it's a, it's a challenging situation for them. All right, that's, that's just my context. Um, what I really want to talk about is um, response to change mostly resistant response to change. And again you, can, again, you can find lots and lots of journalists, lots of PR practitioners. As I, sorry, I, my research has been on journalism, but I think this very much relates to um, public relations as well. Maybe advertising. I don't know enough about advertising to know um, uh, the response in advertising, probably entertainment media. I would think that this would probably be true in, in most media industries, um, that we've got these successive waves of change. The web was knew not that long ago in, in, in my career, uh, certainly. So I know that seems a long time ago to some, some of you, but it wasn't that long ago. Um, so we've got this kind of now three decades. Um, the web browser, the very first web browser, um, emerged from the lab in 1993. Actually, it's been exactly um, 30 years. Um, uh, it was called um, Mosaic. Some of you may recall that. It, was, it came out of a lab at the University of Illinois, a uh, computer lab. Uh, became Netscape, 
it went commercial and became Netscape, but the first web browsers were exactly 30 years ago. The web, exi the internet existed and the web existed, but um, the browsers were revolutionary because they meant that you and I, you know, normal people who were not research scientists or members of the Department of Defense, which is where the internet originated, could use this thing. Uh, it's the graphic, it's a graphic overlay. We, of course, take it completely for granted now, but it's only 30 years old. Um, so it was kind of a revolutionary thing um, when it happened. And, and, <laughs> and the response was the same kind of response, I think, that we've, that we've seen now uh, straight through for 30 years of all these different kinds of things that have come along, of course, with countless exceptions in every organization. And, and, and you know, some, some of you have probably been those exceptions. So not to say that um, people don't embrace change, because some people do. But big picture, <laughs> most people don't. Um, I, and I think that journalists' collective response, I'm going to go through some examples, and you can, you can see if they support this idea. It, it's kind of followed this pattern. Now, the first pattern is, what the hell is this? I don't know, what, I don't know how to use it. Oh my god, um, I have no idea how this works. What is this going to mean to me? Um, that's followed by, it's OK, because clearly, this thing is going to be bad. <laughs> it's going to be bad for journalism. It's going to be bad for what we do. It's going to, be, it's going to raise ethical issues for how do we do journalism. The way we've always done journalism, you know, obviously has had some flaws, but you know, big picture, we do it for a reason. We do it because we're serving society, we're helping citizens you know, govern themselves wisely, all of those kind of big picture things about why we do journalism. Um, uh, again, I do think this applies to other media industries, but you'll, you'll fill in the, um, you know, what's the, what's the big picture goal that we have here. Um, but clearly there's gonna be some problems here. And then of course, ev eventually, sooner or later, it's completely normalized. You can't, how can you, we all live in a digital world now. And it's hard to remember that we didn't live in a digital world um, not that long ago. So, so I think those are kind of the three stages. Um, and what I'm going to talk about mostly is that um, initial, that resistance stage, the trepidation stage. We, we, we kind of get over that, um, maybe not immediately, but we kind <laughs> of get over it um, fairly quickly. But the, that resistance phase, I think, lasts for a while. Um, and then, of course, the normalization phase lasts going forward once you get to it. But it can take a little while, I think, to get to it. So, so a little bit about why this has. So journalists in particular, <laughs> probably more than other media professionals, but particularly journalists, I mean, we train you to be, this starts in J school, right? We train you to be skeptics. We train you in a good way. We train you to question authority. We train you to, train you to question um, everything, really. Um, if someone says this, you know, your mother says she loves you, check it out. Does anyone run that one by you yet? Well, you should, because it's a very famous saying in journalism. <laughs> um, you know, don't believe anything anyone tells you. Uh, you know, be skeptical. We're, that, we're, we're, that, that's, that's the mindset that's ingrained in us, particularly as journalists, um, I think. So, um, uh, so that's one issue. Um, and then we're also, of course, trained in, in particular skills. We know how to do particular things. We train you to do those things in journalism school. I think here at Grady, you're, you, you, get, you get trained to be a little bit more, a lot more um, all-encompassing. You know, you do think about innovation. You do think about different ways of doing things. It's not true for everybody. It's not true of every journalism school. Um, it's not true for um, every kind of newsroom culture. Some cultures are more open to innovation than others are. Um, but nonetheless, we're still training you um, appropriately, of course, but still, um, in particular kinds of skills. And so you know how to do, you're very confident, um, I think you should be, um, when you leave Grady in certain kinds of things and knowing how to do those things. And the, ten and the tendency is to frame the new thing that comes along as irrelevant to that thing I know how to do. What does this have to do with reporting? What does this have to do with editing? What does this have to do with taking a photo? What does this have to do with um, you know, writing, a, writing a really powerful press release? What does it have to do with it? I don't see it. Um, so I'm just gonna kind of say, no, no, that's, that's, that's really not for me. Um, and so the assertion, I've got like four assertions on here, and then I'm gonna go through a series of quotes that are all about these assertions for various um, technologies that have come along. So one assertion is that it's hard that, that kind of relates to that trepidation um, response, I think. I don't, I, don't, I don't know what this is. I don't know how to do it. It's hard because I don't know how to do it. Um, so I can't understand, I don't understand it. My, my media organization isn't giving me the training I need. Really, I hear this every time. Um, they haven't trained me how to do that. Sometimes it's not even true. They have been trained. They just don't 
didn't take. Um, yeah, I mean, you have to do these things in order to, in order for the training to take, just like being in school. Um, it's hard to understand, it's hard to master, it's hard to use properly, so that's one response. Second response is, I don't need it. It's okay that it's hard because I don't need it. Um, I know how to do these things. These things are what really matter, and so I, don't, I really don't need whatever this new thing is. I don't need the internet. I can go out and do my own reporting, which of course you could, um, but nonetheless, um, that's a response. And then a third one, it, and, they, and they, those kind of go together, but a really common response that I've heard <laughs> literally for 30 years over and over in response to every new thing that comes along is we have these really high, we're about accuracy, we're about verification, we're about um, essentially about credibility, we're about building something that people can trust. We can talk about how well that's working, but nonetheless, that's kind of the, the premise. Um, and this new thing's going to endanger that. It's going to undermine it. If we, if we do this new thing, this will be clearer when I show you the quotes, um, it's going to challenge that ability to maintain those high professional standards. I know we could roll our eyes about the high professional standards, but journalists try. We try to maintain them. So that's the third thing. And then the other one, we were just talking about this also at the um, luncheon uh, I just had with a bunch of the um, innovation students, which was really cool, um, is it takes time. It's hard and you don't really need it. But, and also, it takes time away from the things that do really matter. Because the things that really matter are things that I know how to do. <laughs> um, and this takes time away from those things. So let me give you some examples so you can see what you think. Again, I cherry-picked quotes. Um, the examples I'm going to talk about are these, I'm sorry, it's a very cluttered slide. I'm sorry, I was trying to illustrate these things. Um, the internet, that's for some of you who <laughs> remember, um, probably only a very few of you, but I remember. Um, that was Netscape, so I said the, 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 the yeah, first browser came out of the lab at um, Illinois, and uh, when it went commercial, it uh, became Netscape, so an early web browser, that's what it looked like. It doesn't look very friendly today, but again, revolutionary, right? So now I could use the internet. I really couldn't do that before. Um, we talked a little bit about Converge Newsrooms, which was the idea of, some of that was tied up with mobile journalism, but the idea of the Converge Newsrooms, and sorry, that's very cluttered, but that's an example of a Converge, news, a Converge Newsroom, is that the newsroom, um, so it wouldn't just be the newspaper over here and the TV station over here and maybe the website in some far corner. <laughs> they, they tended to put them out of sight and hope they would go away. Um, but we were all going to contribute to um, um, the, kind of the same product. We were all going to kind of be part of this team. <laughs> very well. Um, user comments that I, again, they're still around. We probably don't pay that much attention to them anymore, but they were a huge challenge to journalists in like the mid to late 2000s. Um, so the ability for people to actually say what they thought of a story <laughs> who, um, and publish it so that we could all see it. Usually it was not mm, uh, uh, laudatory. Um, blogs about the same time, actually a little bit sooner, um, probably blogs, I think, are the next ones to come up after the convergence one. That's WordPress, and some of you will remember WordPress, or maybe you use it now, it doesn't look like that anymore. Um, blogs were also revolutionary, so blogs gave people the ability to publish online um, their own stuff just as easily as a journalist could. That was a huge change, and of course, journalists saw that as very challenging. And then social media, and of course, we're still in a social media age. Social media essentially is a microblog, right? So it, 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 it's that same idea, but compressed and, of course, now um, you, you're very visual and, and um, uh, you know, it, it, does, it has all the bells and whistles now, but essentially it's a, it's a I would say it's a microblog. So let me, um, let me talk about this. So starting with the web browsers, and, and most of my, this is the only one that I go into a little bit of detail about because I know it's before your time for most of you. Um, again, you came in, a, a, well, a little over 30 years now, so in January going on 31 years. Um, most journalists, so I did my, <laughs> when I was in journalism school with uh, Janice in uh, graduate school, I did my dissertation in, um, I gathered the data in 1995, so this was just now, newsrooms had started to get access to the internet, so again, the, the browser had emerged. It was kind of experimental at first, um, but by the middle of the decade it was, I, it was uh, relatively few people used it, but newsrooms had it somewhere, very often in the library. So you had to go to the, <laughs> I remember, I remember uh, someone, 
I might have been in the Journal Constitution. I was one of the papers that I studied, anonymized in my dissertation, but it was the Journal Constitution. But I remember them talking about how they, if they wanted to use the internet, or whatever they called it then, I don't think they even said use the internet, but if they wanted to look up something online, they had to go to the morgue, they had to go to the library and get the librarian to look, to do the search for them, because it was so complicated to find anything. And they didn't really know how to do it, but they thought the librarian might be, so they would, they would go to the library and someone would look for them. Um, even at the time, it was sort of like, you know, you really, you could do that yourself. But anyway, um, but the response was, it really, it's not going to affect me. My, the presentation might be a little bit different. Okay, it's on a computer. We kind of get that. Um, but that's it. Well, and which actually wasn't that far off in 1995. But they didn't really see beyond that very much. Um, so what we're doing is essentially the same. All right. So that was, that was kind of the <laughs> initial response. Um, but still they had concerns. They didn't really know what it was. A lot of them actually literally in 1995 had actually not used the internet. They might have gone to the library and had the librarian look up something for them, but most of them had not used it. There were a couple of pioneers. Every newsroom has pioneers. Um, so there were some that used it. Some of them would say, well, I go to so-and-so and, -so and I, he does it for me. <laughs> anyway, um, so they hadn't really used it, but they, I, I mean, my dissertation is full of their worries and their concerns and the, the things that they, knew would be bad about it, even though they'd mostly never seen it. <laughs> um, they had concerns. So, and I'm kind of going to go through each of those different um, aspects for this. Yeah, I, I could find other quotes that would be more supportive, but this really is a theme all the way through. Um, every day that goes by and I'm not trained, um, I'm afraid of it. So it's hard. This is hard to use. I don't, I don't get it. Um, I, I want it. Really, I do. I, I, I love innovation. <laughs> you go back to my first slide. But I don't actually want to change to actually do it, right? Um, I get more and more nervous. It makes me, this is really stressing me out because um, it's so hard and I don't really know what to do about it. Um, but it's okay. I don't really need it. These would be different people. But um, I don't really need it to do my job well. Um, what matters is good journalism. Good journalism is what changes the world, um, not the technology. The technology doesn't really matter, so I don't really need it to do my job. Um, this one comes up, actually, sometimes in the same words comes up for, came up again with social media for sure, uh, with just about every technological change. Well, we, all, we, you know, we used to always have that time to check and see if something was right. Now we don't. Now it's just about getting it up there. Um, that was instantly a concern with the internet. No, it's, like, it's an unfounded concern, but it certainly came up um, right away. Um, and then it takes time away from real journalism. So if we're going to be doing stuff for the internet, um, then that's, that takes energies, personnel, resources from our historical products. So those are all quotes that came from my dissertation. They're from some different I, the links go to the, <laughs> Janet, you can share the slides. I'm happy to share the slides. Janice has the slides. You can click on the links if you care about um, any of this. But those were all from my published uh, articles that came out of my dissertation. So, so they're looking at the internet, which of course we all take completely for granted now and use it every single day in one form or another. Um, and, they're, and they're worried about it. And this is how they're expressing their concerns. Um, convergence, so this, this was um, kind of early 2000s. Um, a lot of news organizations start, well, a lot, a, a, a fair number, a few <laughs> um, news organizations started, I mean, they could sort of see the problem. The problem is that they were, you know, the resources were, were kind of divided. So people were spending a lot of energy covering the story for the newspaper, and then a whole lot of other people were spending a lot of energy covering the story for television. Um, and then other people were putting it on the web, and, and so news organizations thought, well, that's, we're kind of wasting some resources there. So they tried to play with this idea of having one converged newsroom, like you saw that desk in the cluttered slide a couple slides ago, ago of where we're all just going to um, work together. <laughs> we're going to be one big happy family. Um, that didn't. Actually, that did not last very That particular iteration didn't last long. But then within a few years, of course, it became that that's all news organizations now produce content that's visual. It might be video form. It might be text. It might be social. It might be all kinds of different things. But it was a new idea in uh, 10, 20 years ago, um, so in the, in the early to mid-2000s. Um, so it's hard, right? So you can see the same kinds of ideas keep coming up. So. Uh, this is from uh, some Spanish journalists. Uh, this is not from my work. This is from um, someone I'm now co-authors with, but I didn't know at the time. Um, journalists have been working in print for all this time, and now all of a sudden we've got to do something else. We've got to be able to tell a broadcast story. I, that's really hard. That's really frustrating. We don't know how to do this. It's hard. Um, 
this, this was from my, uh, I, this is one of my favorite quotes. I did another set of studies in uh, 2003, I think it was, of um, the converged newsrooms, and I went to several, and, and this was a guy in Dallas <laughs> who said, oh God, <laughs> television, oh my God, it's, it's abhorrent, it's a subspecies. I, I, I went to J school to be a journalist. This isn't even journalism. So I don't need it to do my job well. Um, it endangers our professional standards. We don't, uh, this is from, uh, I want to say, uh, I think it might have been English, British, um, or maybe Scandinavian journalists. Again, this is not from one of my studies. That was from a book chapter, which why well, it's not linked, sorry about that. Um, Multimedia journalists, have, they just they don't really get it, right? They're not about news gathering. They, they don't really know how to do it. They haven't really gone through the thought process of putting a story together. They're just plugging holes. Um, and then, you know, if that happens more pervasively, then we're, we're, we're sunk. <laughs> God forbid. Um, and of course, it takes time away. We've trained people to do this. This was definitely British journalists. Um, we've trained reporters to do video, but they're generally too busy. They've got other things to do. They're not going to bother with that. Why should, we, why should they do video when they can do real journalism? This was the response. Okay, so that's Converged Newsrooms. Blogs um, are the ones I took on next. Um, with blogs, it was, the challenge was a little bit different. Blogs are pretty easy to do. That's the whole point of a blog. Um, it was a little too easy um, for journalists. Um, with blogs for journalists thinking about blogging. So there's, there were two different kinds of reactions to blogs. One, of course, was the barbarians at the gate reaction, just that all these other people are now producing content. But the other one is that we are being asked to do blogs, and how do we, in particular, maintain our objectivity? Because this clearly was a format, and it's a precursor of social media. Um, how do we maintain our, our objectivity, our, our journalistic stance of neutrality in the face of this medium that's, that's really demanding that we be more personal and more, um, um, uh, what's the word I want, uh, uh, kind of assessing uh, what's happening out there in the world. Um, this is from a BBC journalist, uh, actually. So BBC is um, mandated essentially by the government to report to be unbiased, to report with due impartiality. Um, so this was at the BBC, which actually has been quite an innovative news organization overall, but not, uh, not every single person has been uh, of that mindset. Um, we can't write, want to write anything that's partisan. Um, we can't we can't make judgments that we we just can't do that and blogs are encouraging us to do that and that's that's um, it's hard to maintain our objectivity with this format. Uh, this was this was also a British journalist. Actually, I think most of these are British journalists, uh, but not not from my work, uh, but from different people. Um, I just I just kind of like this quote. I, I, it's like being in the middle of a room full of loud, shouty, excitable people yelling at once with all the phones ringing, the fire alarm going off, and some drunken old boy blurring in your ear about what it all means. It's just it's just a bizarre. We, this is not the way to run uh, a media business. So that's a problem with blogs. And he's kind of describing the, the blog there, analogizing the blog. Um, of course, it endangers a high professional standard. It's not journalism. It's as far from journalism as it can get. There's unsubstantiated rumor, prejudice, gossip. Um, you can't rely on it. Um, uh, yeah, so it's, it endangers our professional standard. That's very fundamental response to new things from journalists. They're, they're drawing boundaries. It's a different set of literature, but they're, they're drawing boundaries about what they do, and those boundaries are ethical, moral, normative kinds of boundaries. So you can see it there. Um, and then the last one is, a, it takes time away from real journalism. Um, it, 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 this was another British journalist, obviously, they're based in London. Um, they'll only understand the story if, you, if you're there. You have to go there. Doing a live blog is not at all the same thing. Um, and, and if you're sitting in the office and doing a live blog, then you're not out there um, covering whatever it is that's going on. Um, and you should be. That would be better. User comments, you're seeing the pattern. <laughs> All right, um, so you can sort of see how people are responding to these things. So user comments, well, we didn't like those at all, <laughs> really. I, I, you know, and to some extent, understandably, because many of them are abusive and some of them are idiotic. Um, true. Nonetheless, um, uh, some of them, uh, there was a value in knowing what your audience thinks. Uh, journalists were. Yeah, a lot of journalists just did not engage at all. Um, they refused to engage. And this was a Guardian journalist. Uh, Ian Ashman and I did a study at the Guardian um, in the late 2000s. Sometimes I snipe back. I try to take a deep breath. I say, well, let me see if I can explain to this idiot um, what it is that we're doing. But you know, really, not my job to tell this person what I'm doing. They shouldn't, they shouldn't be thinking this in the first place. Um, I don't need it. It's, it, it's wrong. This was a, um, 
I had my name on this, but this was actually, uh, I believe this was an Israeli journalist. This was from a, our a book project that we did, and we talked to journalists in eight different countries about participatory, we were called participatory journalism, um, but mostly that at that time it was comments, so a little bit of social media was just coming along, um, but mostly comments. Um, yeah, I mean, it's my, my judgment that matters. Um, I don't need to know what users have to think. Yeah, we should, <laughs> we should consider them, we should listen to them, we consult them, and then basically we should ignore them after we've done that. Um, so it's not, it's, not, it's not at the expense of my ethics. Um, Similarly, um, uh, the value of this stuff is disproportionate to all the problems, all the ethical problems it causes us, um, uh, legal problems as well as ethical problems. This was from a local journalist, uh, journalist at a local newspaper in um, the UK. Um, and then uh, the first one is from that same local British journalist, and then back to the Guardian at the bottom. Um, well, great in theory, but in practice, we just don't have time for this. We can barely get the newspaper out. Um, let alone do all this other stuff, and then really, why would I want to respond to Big Dick 119? I would not. Um, and then my last example, because you're clearly you're getting you're seeing the pattern here again, because I'm forcing the pattern on you. And uh, once again, there are always people who run against this trend and, and are and are in fact uh, much more open to all, to all of these things. Nonetheless, <laughs> um, these are real quotes from real people. This was a German journalist, I believe. Um, social media, uh, we're still in this, in this age, um, of course, so unfiltered, uncritical, um, that different from what we do, right? It, um, it, it is a challenge for us in that we, it's hard to maintain the quality in the face of this tide of information that's not of high quality. Um, this is obviously from an Australian journalist. Um, you end up posting some silly around koalas because you know it's going to attract a lot of attention. It's going to be, uh, there was a lot of concern with this um, around traffic whoring. So uh, someone at The Guardian, maybe other places too, called it traffic whoring. Um, and it's hard to find a balance to, you know, how do we, we are interested in high quality work, but um, people aren't interested necessarily in clicking on that high quality work and social media makes that worse. Some of this is, I, we could debate about how true this is. I'm not, I'm not saying it's not true. Um, I'm, I'm just pointing out that it, it is the response. There are other ways of thinking about all of these things, um, and, but this tends to be kind of a go-to response for a lot of people. Um, again, I, if we're sacrificing the truth for the sake of trying to be interesting, that's a problem. This is a US study. Um, uh, these were uh, US journalists. Um, and then finally, um, uh, the first one's a French journalist, so Twitter is the new wire service, AFP, Agence de Presse, the French wire, um, but it takes a lot of time. It's a gold mine, but I, I would get, get lost in it. All that time would be spent trolling around Twitter, um, and I need, I have a job to do. Um, and the other, that last one is also a European journalist. I can't remember, I think maybe German again. Uh, it would be good if someone, uh, if something would take care of this verification. We have to do that, um, but, we, but we, can't, we have other things we have to do, and so it's taking time away from that. You get the idea. Um, lots of quotes. Um, so what's going on here? Um, I don't want to take all my time with quotes. I, I had more, <laughs> but those, those fit on the slide, so I thought that would, that would probably work. Um, so kind of stepping back and thinking about, so what's happening? What are they, what are they doing? Um, why these responses? And it, it seems to me, and this is an idea I've kind of been playing with, and I, well, thoughts on whether this makes any sense at all, but um, that over these three decades, it's been a long time where we've, we've been in a digital journalism world, digital media world. Again, it's not just journalism. Um, journalist habits of practice do keep changing. All of these changes have, of course, been integrated um, into routines. We, we, we do all of these things routinely. We do multimedia routinely. We certainly use the internet routinely, goodness knows. Um, we do, um, uh, we're all on social media, maybe too much. Lots of studies shows we're kind of addicted to social media. Um, so, so those ways of doing things, despite that initial resistance, do change, obviously, um, really, really clearly. But the way we think about what we're doing is really ingrained, and, I, and I'm not sure where that comes from. Some of it, I think, comes from socialization you get here in journalism school. Some of it comes from the socialization that you'll get when you enter a workplace, as you are students. Um, but that way of thinking, some of it probably you bring with you. Um, you know, why? 
I, you know, I went into journalism after Watergate. I mean, this was a way to change the world. And I think some of that is, we, that's very, very deeply ingrained. And I, I still, I feel like I still think like a journalist. So I, I sympathize with what they're saying, and I also get really frustrated with them, You're kind of stepping back and looking at them. So the way we think about what we do is really resistant to change for whatever the reasons might be. Um, and it's very hard to shake those. And so what actually ultimately happens um, is this process of normalization, which I had on the earlier slide. And, I, and let me say a little bit more, and I'll come back to that. Um, so these, con these habits of thought, these concepts about what journalism is actually about, just haven't changed. <laughs> they really haven't changed since I was here at Grady many years ago. Uh, those are still those kind of fundamental concepts about what journalism is about in a democratic society. Sorry, my old hack is a little blurry there. Um, well, all the, many of the images have been a little bit blurry, but he's got a big bottle, so I figure it's probably um, appropriate that he's a little bit blurry. So we see, so that purpose of journalism it is really ingrained in, in the way we think about things and think about what we do. And, the, and, and also we think about, the, despite the fact that there are actual habits of practice do change, we think about what's proper in very consistent ways. How are we, you know, when you talk to journalists, whether or not they themselves are reporters, all about reporting. Um, they really foreground, like, investigation. I, it's good. <laughs> I do, too. But it, it's a very deeply held set of ideas. And, and, and some of those ideas are normative. They're ethical. They're about um, fairness and independence and verification. And, 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 and they're also based on a particular set of skills. And it's really hard to budge that. And so what has to happen for these changes to, um, uh, it, to, to, the, to the way the world is and to the way um, uh, journalism is done or public relations is done, media, media production is done, is something has to happen. <laughs> so there has to be some way to deal with that dissonance because here's this new thing, you see that everyone's using it, and, and how do you respond to that when, you know, deep down, you, you have those really strongly rooted beliefs. So I think there's, there's three responses. Um, I would suggest one is this sort of nostalgia, and, and I would hear this, they didn't express it in these terms, of course, but you would hear that from journalists. And we used to, it used to be all about getting it right. Like journalists never made a mistake before the internet. That's not true. Um, uh, so there was this kind of, this is someone else who wrote this, that was a really nice phrase, this mythic golden age when the news was better made and better respected. So we have this sort of nostalgia, that's one response, not a very productive response, but it's there. Um, there is that sort of reiteration or retrenchment, and that, is, that is, tends to be where we start. Um, we're kind of retrenching these attitudes or, or, or reiterating these very deeply held attitudes about what matters and how journalism is done well. Um, and then kind of a third response is in the, ultimately the one that prevails. And of course, when new, new uh, people enter the workforce, then they bring along kind of different ways, you will, bring along different ways of thinking about things. But the third response is sort of this rationalization of change. And so, we, so those, those uh, markers that we threw up or those, uh, those um, um, uh, reasons why we don't like it <laughs> that we put out there, we, over time, those get rationalized. And we say, well, OK, maybe this is a way that this new thing can fit into our, uh, our, our, our still held perceptions of what journalism is about. Right? And that's the normalization. That's ultimately what happens, I think. Um, so this way doesn't work. This is one response. This is the, um, the resistance response. <laughs> Ultimately, you have to abandon this because you could see why, <laughs> um, because you're going to lose that fight. Um, so that kind of gets abandoned. Um, that evocation of ethics, I, I, it's a tricky one. And we were talking about this at lunch as well. It, you know, you don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. <laughs> you don't want to get rid of those ethical standards. They're, they're fundamentally important. Um, but there's a couple of issues of them with them, I think. Um, one is that they pretty much universally evolved in a media environment that doesn't exist anymore. So those, not that they're not important and, and fundamental, because they are, but you know, the world in which you were gatekeepers and you could, you could, you could sort of determine um, the shape of a story, and maybe you did it well and maybe you didn't, but it was still, you still controlled what that story was. No, we don't live there anymore. We haven't for a while. Um, and the other issue, I think, of course, is that 
you know, me trust in the media is at an all-time low. Some of that is uh, misguided, of course. Some of it is uh, manipulated, of course. Nonetheless, <laughs> the reality is that most people in the US and in the UK as well um, don't trust the media. Um, and so when, the, when journalists start talking about their high ethical standards, we get a lot of eye rolling and then they go off and look at social media because they don't believe it. And so when you put people up on, a, on this, you're putting yourself up on a pedestal that kind of easy to get knocked off from. And so this third option, and I'm almost done, um, this third option of um, rationalizing change, I think is the, it is the normalization process. So you kind of make this thing fit. Um, it is a little bit of a square pig in a round hole sometimes, but you make it compatible with what you're doing anyway. And, and over time then, it becomes the way you do things. I think, I think that's what's happened um, with, with virtually all of these changes that we've had. Um, so uh, these are just some examples on a slightly um, older uh, site there, but you can find um, the newer ones pretty easy to find. So we're doing all these different things. So we're verifying, uh, we're verifying information that comes from users. We're, we're um, uh, you know, kind of seeing how things, you know, how we are still gatekeepers even in this social media world. You could argue about whether we are, um, uh, and so on. Lots of lots of really interesting stuff being done around computational journalism um, and so on. So we kind of we go through this process. Of Rationalization, and then that takes us to the point where we, in our heads, we say, okay, this works. This works for journalism. This works to do what's important to us um, because we've gone through that shifting of the thing. We don't shift the way we think about what's important. We shift our way of thinking about how, how or whether this new thing fits into what we think is important. And we determine, out of self-preservation, that it does, ultimately. Um, so I, you know, all of those things that I trotted through on the slides are just part of how journalism is done, and have been now for <laughs> the internet, right? We, we all use the internet. Um, so, so we're finding this way to change what we do, to make what we do fit what we think is what we should be doing, because we're not really changing the way we think about what we should be doing, if that makes sense. And then to finish up, um, <laughs> so what is the point of all the resistance? In some ways, it's very exas exasperating as you look at it and you think, oh, not again. Don't tell me again about how it's so important to get it right when you're going to get wrong all the time. Um, so in, in, in hindsight, you can say, well, that was just an exercise in futility because um, you're going to adopt this thing anyway. But I actually don't think it's an exercise in futility. I think it actually, for each generation, a short generation, you know, maybe five or six or, or, or you know, eight years it comes along, I think it helps journalists articulate what really is important to them. Now, it's exasperating in that you think, well, if they would just get ahead of the change, <laughs> if they would just sort of not always be the one following the change and therefore not shaping it but having to be shaped by it, that would be nice. So we can hope for that. Um, but it does, it does still, um, I think enable journalists to, to kind of reiterate in whatever the current um, framework is, current technological framework to a large extent, why what they do matters. And they've changed, the, again, the, the habits of practice, what they do does change, but they have kept hold of, for better or worse, <laughs> and sometimes it's worse because it slows them down and sometimes entrenches um, um, things that aren't necessarily responsive to where the audience is. We, we could talk about um, the, some of the downsides to that approach, but I, I think it does remind them of what they do and, and what they're fundamentally about. And those things do matter. Potentially they matter um, even more today in this age of AI. So of course now <laughs> the newest innovation to come along and we're seeing, we're seeing much the same response. Um, you know, there's, a, there's an understanding that we need innovation, that, we, that change is necessary, but there's a great deal of trepidation um, about what that change is going to be and how it's going to work. I didn't, didn't reproduce all that well. But, um, but of course, the next thing that's coming, that's here, it's here now, it's not just coming, um, is um, artificial intelligence. Um, or it's getting exponentially better um, as we sit here. Um, it, you know, the, one of the, a few months ago, the, ish, the, the response was, well, yeah, but it's not, it, it gets things wrong, which it does. Um, it has hallucinations, they're called, right? So it fills in gaps. If it doesn't know the answer, it just makes something up. Um, but, I, you know, that's, that's changing 
every day, right? It's getting better and better and better, and it's going to stop doing those things. Um, so, so how do we respond to it? Um, uh, and, I, and I guess I would end on a kind of optimistic response, I think. And we can talk about what you think, how journalists will, will or should respond. Um, but those winners take low. The winners that I started with at the beginning, what are they doing that's working for them? I think they figured out, most of them, some time ago actually, that what their USP, what their unique uh, value proposition is, um, unique selling point, unique value proposition, you know what I mean? What they do really well is what AI can't do. Um, and I don't see, I don't know, I'm, I'm not a futurist, futurologist, futurist. Um, who knows what it'll do in a month's time, let alone five or 10 years. But I think that the, the journalism that really is going to be impactful in society will continue to be the journalism that humans can do because we have context, because we can respond to people and their context. And you know, we can do things that it's going to be, at least for a while, pretty hard for a machine to do, I think. And I, my hope <laughs> um, is that those successful news organizations will be the ones that do that because they're going to have to abandon the things that AI can do quicker, better, um, without wasting a lot of human resources that could be better used. Um, so I think we need to, I think they're not wrong about those ethical things. Um, but I think that, I think maybe one, uh, something else they, they're thinking about is how can we really create stories that are meaningful to people, not just inform people, important though that is. Um, uh, and, and informing them accurately, <laughs> not whatever gibberish um, AI and, and, uh, and human actors as well are producing and disseminating. Um, but what can we do that people will connect with? And I think that's still, at least for now, a, a human element. And I, and I, I would hope <laughs> that that's how journalists respond. I do think it will be uh, the more resourceful organizations that do that the best. But this is something that any organization can do if they're willing to do it, if they're willing to put the resources in it. Um, so it's not just the New York Times is of the world. Others can do this as well. Um, so how do you respond to AI? I think you respond to AI by being human. I don't think you have much choice. I think you have to respond to AI by being human um, because all those other things, the machines are going to be able to do much better. So particularly for the students in the room, um, this is still what you need to be. You need to be perhaps a little bit more open to change. <laughs> that would be good. Um, but, uh, but, but I think you need to, to be human. So there you are. That's it. <laughs> I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> just wondering if anyone has done any research um, or if you've looked into this at all it strikes me that those companies that you know win most um, were at various points privately owned or partially privately mm -hmm. owned mm -hmm. because there have been very large companies that have not adopted they've been owners of the smaller newspapers smaller television stations mm -hmm. and I'm curious whether anybody's looked at that bias for action because mm -hmm. we did see it I come from the from I come from the shoddy television world, um, and, it's, and it's okay. Um, but in that world, uh, there was a station WRAL who was privately owned, who had the first HD TV, and I just wonder if that's been investigated. Yeah, that's yeah, a really good point. I I, I don't know if, if someone has specifically looked at that in the context of innovation, but in general, it's very much about the cor the. Cor whether it's a corporate culture or uh, non-corporate, it's very much about the newsroom culture. But that's hard to do. You know, top-down doesn't always work. Bottom-up doesn't always work. You know, you, know you, you have to somehow get it right. Um, I, you know, I, I live in the UK now, and so the BBC, of course, is a public broadcaster. They, in general, have been quite, I mean, they're hugely resourced, which is another issue of some controversy. But nonetheless, they, they do have a lot of resources. Um, and they've done, and I'm actually working on a project now with some other people around um, Europe. Um, you know, they've, they've got news labs, they've got kind of sandbox spaces where they're giving people, you know, the ability to experiment with some things, play with some things, see what works, you know, reach out to audiences in different ways, whatever it might be. So I think it's, 
I, I think it's about the culture, because there are some small organizations that are quite innovative. Um, I, you know, sustainability is difficult, and you, know, you have to have enough to keep going and to get it wrong. You know, I, I, I taught, um, in, in City, I taught a class in journalism innovation, and, and um, you know, you don't always get it right. And, and in fact, it's much more of an iterative process. You get it wrong five times, and then something clicks, and you, you, know, you learn from each of those things, and then, and then something clicks, and it works. So, but, but very much about corporate culture. Not necessarily the size, but the people with the bigger organizations, if they're willing to do it, they're not all willing to do it. Gannett, I, well, you know, they're not all willing to do it. But if they're willing to do it, the size helps them because they have that room to fail. You know, if the Times try something and doesn't work, they just say, well, okay, we'll go on to the next thing. Um, so it, uh, the, the, the issue of the corporate culture is really important. And I don't think it's inherently a size thing, but I do think that bigger organizations have a little bit more room to fail, which is part of the process. I mean, you, don't, you know, it's easy to make fun of them, but, you know, who knows? It's hard to know if you're just starting out and looking at mobile journalism, as it was called at the time. You don't know it's going to work. You know, you don't know how much to spend on the technology and the training and everything else for something that's still a question mark. So easy in hindsight to say, well, <laughs> duh. Um, but, you know, at the time, you don't really know. I don't know. I don't know if that answers your question. I, um, I don't, I'm, I'm sure there is research um, that kind of from an organizational um, perspective about innovation, but I don't know it as well. I tend to know more of the journalism, but I, it's, it's a good point. You should do it. Do <laughs> have a question? I just have one quick question, and it, well, I don't think it was on one of, the, one of your central points, but one of your early slides, you talked about the fact that the kind of the big successful players, part of what they reap or rely on is the labor of the audience. And yeah. I'm not 100% sure what you're referring to with that um, phrase. Oh, the audience labor. Yeah, sorry, I, I blew by that point. Yeah, you're right. Um, they, uh, particularly for social, for sharing, Right, so they're relying on audiences to, to uh, for content distribution to a in, to a large extent. So th that's audience labor to some extent. Um, contributions, you know, when when a story happens and they and you know people can contribute to um, you know live reporting. But mostly, I was thinking there about what how people are uh, how audiences are now pretty fundamental in dissemination of content. That's uh, it's a form a form of audience oh, that one, a form of audience labor. Is kind of what I was thinking. Yeah, I didn't. I, uh, yeah, and uh, and audience attention, and of course, direct revenues is um, uh, it takes a variety of forms, but paywalls in particular. There's a lot of media organizations are now behind paywalls, as you know. We can debate. <laughs> well, that's an innovation too. That's a that's a business model innovation. Um, works works pretty well for some. Doesn't work so well for others. Um, but there. But you know, again, I mean, the New York Times again um, was as you know, was innovative in experimenting with paywalls. And they've gone through some different versions of their paywall until they found it to the point where they are now, which, you know, they don't stand still, but I mean, it seems to be working pretty well for them. Um, the Guardian, on the other hand, which is actually quite an innovative organization, has made a decision um, never not to go behind a paywall, um, to be free, and they make some big noble statement about it. Maybe, maybe they believe it, maybe it's true. Um, that they, you know, that, that they're, they're journalism for everybody, they don't want to go behind a paywall become, because it becomes an elite audience. Um, but their response, and if any of you use The Guardian or look at their website, their response is that every time you click on a page, you get this half the page or two thirds of the page gets taken up with this big guilt trip message. <laughs> what are you going to give us? <laughs> yeah. Um, but they are free, so. This sort of journey through your research over the last 30 <laughs> years is, is awesome, and it's very obvious why you are this year's winner of the Deutschland <laughs> Award for your lifetime contributions to research. Grady <sighs> Grad. <laughs> red and Black alone. Yeah, red and Black Learned alone. Learned it all Jane red Singer. Let's give her a thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for coming.